Okay. Uh, okay. Good morning. I mean, sorry, good evening. Uh, and so sunny out, it feels like morning. Uh, and thank you so much for joining our live virtual event tonight. I'm Tom Nisley from Finney Books in Seattle, the sister store of Madison Books here also in Seattle. Uh, and we're grateful to be in this virtual space with our fellow Books in Common Northwest stores, Paulina Springs Books in Sisters, Oregon, and the Country Bookshelf in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, visit www.booksincommonnorthwest.com for more information and follow us on Eventbrite to register for more great Books in Common events. Before we get to our speaker this evening, we wanted to point out a few things about this virtual space. Uh, you can pur purchase a copy of David's book by visiting booksincommonnorthwest.com and clicking on the logo of your favorite sponsoring store. Uh, we are recording this event and it will be viewable at a later date on the Books in Common Northwest YouTube channel after the event concludes. Uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, submit them by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or drop them in the chat and we'll get to them as time allows. Uh, if you run into any tech issues along the way, we recommend you first try exiting and re-entering the meeting. If you aren't able to re-enter the webinar, you can view the live stream of the event at that YouTube channel. Uh, we recommend trying headphones to fix any sound issues. Uh, and lastly, we want to remind you that this is a shared creative space that we want to remain safe for everyone at the bottom of your screen or drop them in the chat and we'll get to them as time allows. Uh, if you run into any tech issues along the way. We and, uh, and we ask that you be respectful of everyone who has joined us tonight. Offensive or inappropriate comments or questions will see the user dismissed from this space. Um, okay, so uh, I'm here with our two Davids uh, and everyone else. Thanks for joining us. Um, I would call them the two Davids in Seattle writing, except David Guterson might object, but uh, two old friends, two Davids, uh, David Laskin and David B. Williams, um, who I've gotten to know, been fortunate enough to get to know um, in my role as a bookstore owner. Uh, and they're two of the best nonfiction writers in town. They're generous, committed to their work. Uh, so it's always a pleasure to talk books with them. Uh, and so I'll start with our featured speaker tonight, David Laskin, uh, who uh, has written a dozen books, all nonfiction until, is that right? That's what Wikipedia said. That's, uh, that's right. <laughs> uh, all nonfiction until this year, which I'm sure will come up as a subject, uh, switching to fiction. Uh, his new book is What Sammy Knew. Um, just came out from Penguin. Um, and uh, his most recent books, Children's Blizzard, which came out 2004, uh, The Long Way Home, An American Journey from Ellis Island to the, uh, to the Great War, which came out in 2010, and The Family, Three Journeys into the Heart of the 20th Century from 2013. And the last two were both winners of the Washington State Book Award. Um, he lives in Seattle. I know he also spends a lot of time in Eastern Oregon. Um, and then David B. Williams uh, has written about a half dozen books. Um, uh, most recently, uh, Too High and Too Steep, Reshaping Seattle's Topography, and one of the best-selling books in Finney Books' history, Seattle Walks. Uh, he's uh, Seattle's premier local historian. He's a tour guide, both actual and virtual. Uh, and his new book, Home Waters, uh, a, uh, a Human and Natural History of Puget Sound. He just got a finished copy. Comes out April 24th, is that right? Yeah. From the University of Washington Press. Uh, another of the books we're most looking forward to this season. And uh, he will be back in this virtual space of Lyanda Lynn Haupt in, uh, on June 17th, I think. We yeah, I think that's it. Had that scheduled already. So the Davids uh, have planned their discussion. Uh, they'll talk, David will read a little from the book at some point, I think. Um, maybe for 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have a little time for uh, Q&A afterwards. Uh, and we're so glad you all have joined us. Take the way, David. All right, thank you kindly, Tom, for the introduction. And it is an honor and pleasure to be here. I'd like to start by saying that both David and I and Tom live and work on the unceded land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land itself and those who have inhabited it since time immemorial. 
I'd also like to thank Madison Books, the Country Bookshelf, and Paulina Spring Books, and the Books in Common Northwest endeavor to help promote writers and writing during this era of the virtual talk. I've been lucky to be friends with David for many, many years. I first met him through his wonderful book, Rains All the Time, a Connoisseur's History of Weather in the Pacific Northwest. Anyone who is into weather wants to understand it, you should own this book. I then became closer and got to know him better also through his next book, Children's Blizzard, uh, which has, I think, one of the best descriptions I've ever read of freezing to death. So if that's not a good sign, I don't know exactly what is a good sign. And more importantly, we really have cemented our friendship over the years through our mutual friendship with Ivan Doig, who we both know treasured the country bookshelf. I think his widow, Carol, thinks that the store has sold more of Ivan's books than any other bookstore. So um, we all appreciate um, that. And I'd really like to start off our conversation tonight by focusing on Ivan, um, who David, you note in, in, in the book is one of two people you dedicate this book to. And we've talked over the years many times about Ivan's influence on both of us. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that friendship and that influence of Ivan as a, as a writer, as a friend, as a mentor, all of these different aspects. Yeah, well, th first of all, thanks David for partnering with me. Thanks Tom, thanks Jessica. It's and thank all of you for, for being here. It's, it's really great. And we feel your presence, even though we can't see you. Ivan, you know, I really think I owe my hitting my stride, let's say, to Ivan. Um, Ivan and I met when I reviewed one of his books, Bucking the Sun for the Washington Post. And Ivan being Ivan wrote me a little typewritten thank you note noting that we lived in the same zip code and maybe we would meet one day. And it took a while for us to meet and then become friends and then become really good friends. But Ivan was very private and shy in some ways, very reserved, really guarded his privacy, but he was the most generous writer I've ever met. And um, just supported me in every way a veteran writer can support a younger writer and um, including, and, and I think this maybe will lead into our discussion, including um, the idea of maybe jumping the fence from nonfiction to fiction. Um, probably most of you who know and love Ivan's work think of him as a novelist, but of course, before Ivan published his first novel, The Sea Runners, he wrote a couple of highly acclaimed nonfiction books, a memoir, uh, This House of Sky, which really made his name, and um, Winter Brothers. So Ivan, and before that, he had a very distinguished career as a journalist. So Ivan and I did talk about, you know, as, as he put it, jumping the fence, and I filed away his advice, his encouragement, but didn't really act on it, unfortunately, during his lifetime. I know he would have been cheering me on. But anyway, he, he very major figure for me. Great. Um, so I've read your book, loved it. It was very, feel fortunate to have been able to see into a new world based on what you were saying. And um, you know, I always think it's good to begin a discussion like this. If you could just give a little bit of summary. I mean, what, what, is, what is the book in your words? Yep. Okay. So What Sammy Knew is a coming-of-age story. It's set in 1970. It begins on New Year's Eve of 1969. And it's really the story of a high school senior named Sammy Stein, who is a late bloomer, a wannabe writer, kind of a dreamy kid. And um, Sammy really wakes up in the course of this book. He falls in love for the first time. The girl he falls in love with happens to be a political firebrand who's obsessed with the radical politics of that day. So we're talking about 1970s. So Black Panthers were a major force in uh, on the radical left. SDS, the Students for Democratic Society, was kind of morphing into the weather underground and engaging in what we would now call domestic terrorism. So Sammy, this sweet, innocent kid, finds himself in this world. He runs away from home. He ends up in the East Village of New York City. 
and lots and lots of stuff happens. There's a lot of plot. And Sammy, in the course of the book, really um, what Sammy knew and what Sammy didn't know become really important, not only to him, but to, um, to, to the lives of the characters that he's involved with. And I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but it's, it's fast paced, it's exciting, and there are lots of twists and turns. Yeah, absolutely. I, I did not expect, uh, per, particularly just speaking for myself, I did not expect the ending and, and the direction it went. So that was a big um, unexpected. But going back to Ivan, and you know, we both know the story, you alluded it to a second about the novel Sea Runners, which uh, Ivan has said, you know, he found this little nugget of information about these two guys canoeing down and arriving, I guess, in Astoria, and he could never find anything else. So he figured, well, if I don't know anything, then why don't I make it up? And just wondering, you know, my understanding with, I mean, I know that with what Sammy knew, it has a similar genesis, that you were going in one direction and then pivoted, as we say in the modern world, to a new direction. So What's up with that, man? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. So, and again, Ivan was very much behind that that pivot. Very different circumstances, but similar kind of recognition. So, let me tell the story. It's a little, it's a little bit involved, but I, but I'd like to tell it because I think it'll really set up the readers, all of you future readers, for what the book is about and what's what what's at the heart of it. So, before I decided to hang out my shingle as a novelist, I was, I wrote, as Tom said, my last book was The Family, which is a history of my own family. And after I wrote that book, I was having trouble really fixing on another subject and cast around, had a lot of ideas, none of them really panned out for one reason or another. But at some point I became, I, I think there's no other word for it, obsessed by the life of a woman named Ethel Foreman. And she's the other person that the book is dedicated to. Ethel Foreman uh, was an African-American domestic worker who lived with my family and worked for my family for the first 10 years of my life. Uh, when I was born, she was already working for us. Um, and I was her favorite. I was born on her birthday. Uh, and I, that was kind of enough to seal the deal. And we were extremely close in the way a child can be very close to a very special caretaker. Um, so I guess maybe about five years ago now, that obsession kicked in. Who was Ethel? You know, I knew, obviously I knew her well intimately from, from being raised by her and part of it, both my parents worked full time. So she was really my caretaker, but I didn't know where she was from. I didn't know if she had her own family. I really knew nothing about her. So I set out on this kind of voyage, this saga of research. And I discovered that she was born and raised in the Northern Necker, Virginia, where three of the first five presidents, slaveholders, all of them, uh, were born and raised. Also, I her grandparents were enslaved. I found the records of the, the, the last slaveholders. I found the records of her son, who she only had one son who died in a boating accident when he was in his 20s. Um, and I traced her migration through the South. She, as I said, was born in Virginia, worked in Baltimore, spent some time in Roanoke. So I, through these the genealogical research that I'd become pretty good at in the course of working on the family, I outlined her life and I set out to write about it. But like Ivan, I realized at some point I just didn't know enough. I had, I had her voice, but I didn't have the words. I didn't, she never wrote any letters, or at least no letters that I found. There was no memoirs, no descendants, nobody to interview. I couldn't really get inside her head the way that you want to get inside the head of a person who's, who's going to be at the center of a book. And so I decided to make it up. And as I said, jump the fence and make Ethel a major character in this novel. Um, so she, the Ethel, um, who I knew and loved 
is the basis for Tutu, uh, the character who's a central character in Sammy. And, and I actually should have mentioned when I was giving the precy of the book that Tutu, the character, is, is Sammy's live-in housekeeper. He's very close with her, just as, as I was with Ethel. They, um, their lives are very joined in a way. And Sammy's growing up and kind of moving out um, had ripples very serious ripples in the life of Tutu and of her of her grandson Leon. So I um yeah, I I became a novelist really I would say largely out of my dedication to this story. This my dedication, my desire to honor Ethel and her life, her impact on me and to really be able to dedicate something to her to make her kind of to bring her back to life. Great. I mean, I mean, it certainly comes out that way from in the, in, as I was reading it, I mean, you can feel the, the, the passion in, in, in terms of your prose, in terms of your enthusiasm of trying to write about it, someone who meant something to you in a respectful and very honorable Good. way. I think that really stands yeah. out about it. Um, and thinking about this sort of theme of fiction and nonfiction, I sort of have, I guess, two questions. One, how did you approach nonfiction differently than fiction? And then another question that I would go with that is, what, did, what skills do you think you acquired as a nonfiction writer that helped you in doing a book of fiction? Well, really, yeah, thinking about that, that connection between those two. You know, I think maybe the best way to answer that question, David, is to read something from the book. Um, and I let me set it up a little bit because I think it will, um, I think it will answer your question um, better than I could uh, just kind of off the top of my head. So I'm going to read you a passage uh, that is. Um, so as I mentioned when I was introducing the book, Sammy runs away from home. And he ends up in the East Village of New York City, and it's winter. And I am describing Sammy's kind of first Saturday of freedom in New York, alone, unsupervised, unchaperoned, and it's January 1970. So that's the setup. Now, let me just discourse a little bit about this. If I were wearing my other hat, my nonfiction hat, and wanted to uh, evoke the East Village of New York in 1970, I would have done a lot of research, first of all, architecture, uh, who were the people living there, the sort of the hippie movement that transformed that neighborhood. I would have read popular histories. I would have read memoirs. I would have interviewed people. And then I would have, um, kind of woven together all of that research in a series of quotes, uh, references, evocations that were taken from the memories and from the works of other people. But in fiction, you make it up. And uh, so let me read you, you know, you can imagine the, the way I described how I would have done it if I were writing nonfiction. Here's how I did that scene set uh, in the East Village in Sammy. The days were getting longer, but it was still freezing on the streets, a cold more pitiless and penetrating than anything Sam had known in the suburbs. There was no place to hide from the wind. Airborne garbage scoured the canyons like flocks of crows. Inside, the radiator hissed morning and night, turning the apartment into a sauna. Sam didn't care. He was enchanted at being free and unsupervised in the city for the first time in his life. The Saturday streets were like a giant polar party. Everyone was wrapped in streamers of riotous wool and alpaca. Eyes peeped from between scarves and hoods checking him out, challenging him, greeting, inviting, dismissing, lusting, probing. Each block housed a library of stories. 
on the sidewalk, foreign languages faded in and out like nighttime stations on a car radio. Sam knew it was a tight, narrow island, but the cityscape felt infinite. Brick and stone and glass and asphalt and wrought iron endlessly replicated in every direction, all of it teeming ceaselessly with people and cars. He was intoxicated and flattened. He wanted to rush down every street, sample every cookie at every bakery, eavesdrop on every conversation, even if he had no idea what language they were speaking, stalk random beautiful strangers on their mysterious rounds to clubs and cafes and dark little closet bars and bedrooms humid with flowers and rumpled sheets. Lovers, haters, vendors, buskers, pushers, preachers, crazies, hippies, saints, models, spies, runaways, bums, junkies, flunkies, wannabes, has-beens, washouts, paranoids, poets, rockers, mockers, punks, cons, soldiers, winos, debutantes, and deadbeats, all of them freezing together on the patchwork jingle jangle sidewalk. Sam felt himself spiraling up to heaven like a helium balloon. So I think that kind of answers your question better than I could have. I, so yeah, I, I think as you see, what I did was just, you know, I, I was steeped in that period, obviously. I mean, it, it's not as if I did no research. Um, and I certainly, the political violence in the book and the, the tilt to violence that was that was the dominant political note on the left was something that I immersed myself in. But I really had to use different muscles, you know, the, the different writerly muscles to evoke this scene with, you know, what I hope came across as the, the rhythm, the bounce, the stride, the, you know, the street life, rather than the pastiche of quotes and interviews, which I would have done for, you know, if, if I were writing what I used to write, nonfiction. Right. So uh, sort of a, a quick question on that. How many drafts, how long did it take you to, I mean, that's a, that's a, a very fleshed out scene and you, you cover a lot of ground. I'm just sort of intrigued as to how, how long did it take you to do something like that? Well, you know, David, it really varied. I, I think that passage just came pouring out. Um, and, uh, you know, I, so an editor once said to me, I have a little tick as a writer that I tend to make lists. And I never realized that, but he was right. I do, and it's, it can be too much. Um, you know, page after page of lists, you know, it, the, the reader glazes over. But I think it's kind of a default mode for me. And so, and I think when I make those lists, I think I just kind of hear them in my head and, and out they come. Other parts of the book were much more difficult. Um, the dialogue gave me a little bit of trouble at first. Some of the transitions gave me trouble. But, you know, I, I think to get back to the nonfiction versus fiction question, for me, the hardest thing in nonfiction is striking that balance between your research and your own insights. Whereas in fiction, it's much it's just much more serendipity involved. Things come to you. And I, I, I know that's anticipating another question, so I don't want to get too much into that. We'll probably talk about that later. But um, so that I find oddly, I write fiction faster than I write nonfiction. It comes out more fluidly, maybe. Mm -hmm. But then it. I, I also do tend to um, you know, throw it in the garbage and and do another draft, you know, kind of from scratch. So I think in a way that the slowness of nonfiction, for me at least, is, um, as I said, striking that balance. So, oh, I know there's a great quote about, uh, you know, the, the street life of the East Village. 
1970 from somewhere. Where is that? Was <laughs> that? Is that the best quote? And then you find it. Well, it actually wasn't quite as good as I thought. Oh, I'll rummage around for something else. Or, you know, I'll balance it with three interviews. So it's that kind of, for me, it's finding that balance um, can be very time consuming. Whereas when you're free to make it up, um, you know, you, you just kind of, I wouldn't say toss it off because it's polished and worked over, but I think it does tend to flow more readily. Yeah, so I mean, that, that also sort of leads into thinking about the characters you have and thinking about characters you have in your nonfiction. I mean, particularly in whether it's the children's blizzard, you have this whole array of school kids where you had to create their characters. You had to pull them out. And, you know, you were using, you had real people who were your tongue stories. And in this book, you have a variety of characters who are based on your past. And just sort of thinking about, you know, how did you end up creating them? And are there ones you like more than others? Good question. So part of what gave me courage to write a novel is that people, when talking about or reviewing my nonfiction books would frequently say, oh, your characters are so strong. I really relate to them or I really understand them. There's a little boy in the children's blizzard who um, gets caught in a storm and is almost freezes to death. And um, a couple of friends are like, I just you know, really felt it, um, felt his struggle. So I, that gave me, um, more confidence, you know, I thought, okay, you know, I, I can do this, I, I can create people. But I, I think for me, the hardest thing in writing fiction was what, to, you know, so, so some of the characters, especially Tutu, is based on a real person, a very important person for me. But when to cut the tether to reality and when to invent, you know, what to, you know, really put in from memory or to, to some extent from research, because as I said, this book was before it became a novel, when it was in its memoir form was kind of steeped in research and when to just kind of cut loose. And I think this might be a good opportunity to read another passage from the book that will illustrate that kind of balancing act between um, drawing on real events, a, a real person's background, and just kind of going crazy and making it up. So let me set this up a little bit. Um, Sam uh, is uh, has visited, Tutu um, lives with Sam's family, but she also has her own apartment in Harlem. And Sam visits her uh, one weekend. And that's actually kind of based a little bit on something that almost happened to me because Ethel did invite me to visit her apartment in Harlem um, and stay with her, but my, I never did it. My parents never let me. So, and during the course of this weekend that Sam spends with Tutu, she opens up about her past and um, really kind of lays a lot of, stuff on him, heavy stuff, as, as we said back in the 60s. And um, some of it is drawn right out of Ethel's history that I researched, and some of it is invented out of whole cloth. And I don't think I'm going to really tell you which. I'll just read it and, and see what you all think. Okay, so Sam lay there. He's kind of reflecting back um, after the weekend. Lay there with his hands crossed behind his head, willing the crack in the ceiling to heal. Tutu always told the truth. He was sure of it, but he was having trouble with some of what she told him late that night in her apartment. The blood of presidents runs in my veins. Her exact words. Sam shook his head against the pillow. Tutu? Kin to George Washington? She said her people came for the northern neck of Virginia, birthplace of three of the first five presidents, Washington, Madison, and Monroe, slaveholders every one. Of course, my folks weren't from the Northern Neck. You're not from someplace you were brought to as a slave. See this bright skin? That color came to me from a white master. Slave master is what I'm talking about. Tutu claimed that her people, 
and George Washington's people were the same people, only her people were their secret black bastards. Maybe not old George himself, but some kin of, kin of his got children on our women folk. They should put that in your history books, Sammy. Sam tried to conjure it. George Washington grabbing the washerwoman by the waist, pulling her down, splitting her open, getting up afterwards to dust off his wig, averting his eyes when the little ginger-colored slave baby was born. Tutu's great, 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 whatever. Holy Jesus. But why would she say it if it wasn't true? And that other stuff, the terrible evil stuff he couldn't write, wouldn't write, didn't know how to write. After all that happened, how could Tutu stand working for white folks, white men? How could she even look at them? Sam shut his eyes, forcing himself back to that night in her apartment. It was late. The dishes were done and put away. He wanted to watch TV, maybe catch the end of the Knicks game. But Tutu summoned him. Sit with me, Sammy. She was at her kitchen table. Something I need to tell you. So he sat down across from her, praying she wasn't going to make him pray again. Something bad, she started in and took a deep breath. Something that happened to me when I was your age. Sam pictured a bony, shy, bow-legged tutu, squinting a little, as pretty as she was ever going to be. I needed work, Sammy. I couldn't stand another day in that cabin with my mama and those steaming tubs of clothes. So I took the bus over to the next town. There was an oyster plant there, fish house, we called it, where they hired black folks to shuck. I went around to the back door the way I knew I was supposed to. You ever shuck before, girl? The owner asked. Mr. Norton was his name. Yes, sir, I told him, though it was a lie. You prepare to live here? He asked. Beside the fish house on the other side of a creek stood a row of shanties, plank and tar paper shacks rattling in the wind off the bay. Oyster shells heaped everywhere. Girls in the three shacks to the left, Mr. Norton told me. Boys on the right. I'll pay you 65 cents a gallon. Sunday's off. We patrol those shanties every night. My son, Mr. Jamie, and me. Any trouble and you're out. Got it? But there was trouble, Sammy. How could there not be? So, uh, yeah, lots of truth and lots of fiction woven together in that it's, passage. Yeah, and so the, that's Tutu, obviously, is a character that you, you know, based on somebody, but you have many characters in your book who were created just out of your own little mind. Um, I don't mean that negatively. <laughs> <laughs> you Out of thin air, I guess, as they say. And I'm thin just air. wondering, you know, was there some particular process you went through? Were there surprises as you created those characters? I mean, I, I remember in high school, I hated high school English. And, and by the way, my last high school English uh, teacher, the student teacher was a guy named David Gooderson, uh, mm. my student teacher, but I dropped out. So he has nothing to blame for me. Uh, but I remember thinking about, well, don't, don't people just write what they write? And why do we have to read between the lines? And don't characters go? Don't they know, you know where they're going? And so I'm intrigued. How did you, you know, what was the process and what were the surprises with your characters? Right, right. So let me bring in Ivan again. Um, Ivan once said to me, never, ever teach or participate in a workshop. Total waste of time. And so, you know, like everything Ivan said to me, I took it you know, as gospel, you know, Ivan said workshops, blah, blah. So I kind of steered away from workshops, but at some point uh, I kind of came around. I, as you know, I was part of an organization called Fish Trap, which is a kind of a writer's, um, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's, it's motto is, you know, dedicated to clear thinking and writing in and about the West. So it's, it's kind of a writer's gathering um, they have workshops, they have readings, they do the great read, the big read, I guess it's called. Um, and so I did a, a couple of, I taught a workshop, actually one about Ivan um, at Fish Trap, and I started participating in a couple of workshops and um, found them very useful as a fledgling fiction writer. And, you know, so there are some tips that come, that come out of workshops in terms of character. 
Um, and these are probably cliches, but you know they, they were they were good cliches. I mean, one was, you know, when your character gets up in the morning, what kind of pajamas do they wear? What's in their pocket? What's on their bookshelves? You know, who, what, give you know just have a sense of their physicality, their ordinariness, their you know how they live in their skin, who they are, what makes them tick, and so. You know, I found that useful just to kind of get in the head, get in the space of my characters. And some of them just kind of came out kind of, you know, fully fledged. You know, um, uh, I just knew them inside and out. Most of them, especially the ones that I knew inside and out, were based on people I knew. And again, you know, this is the kind of the favorite question for a novelist. You know, is this your mother? Did you put in, you know, your friend David Williams? Is he that, you know, the hero of the book? Uh, no, that the hero is based on David, but no, it's not, it's not David himself. But so there's always a based on, but but it it varies, some more or less. Well, let me, let me, let me edit that, cross out that always. There's often a based on but not always. And sometimes characters, at least for me, have no model in real life. There's no, um, I'm not thinking, oh, this is, you know, like my old friend George, or, oh, you know, so-and-so was very political. I'll interview her and find out, you know, kind of weave in her backstory. Some of them just kind of popped out. And Again, you know, I, I don't want to harp on Ivan too much, but hey, why not? I've, Ivan is the kind of my guardian angel. You know, Ivan did encourage me to keep open to the, as I said before, the serendipity, the, the, the lucky find. He had this expression, thinking through your fingers, where you're typing or you're at a keyboard and things emerge that maybe you didn't plan. A character who just appeared to you out of whole cloth. And I think this kind of is a good lead into the final reading I'm gonna do. Um, and uh, let me set this up a little bit um, for you all. So this is a scene between a character named Leon, who is Tutu's grandson, and a character whose nickname is the rabbi, who's a record producer or the father of a record producer. And Leon is going, he, he, Leon, is his dream is to be a singer. He, he's going for what he thinks is his audition, uh, but the door is basically slammed in his face. And this is the aftermath of that scene. And this is very much something that just came to me. I didn't have any idea the scene would be in the book. And both Leon and the rabbi, I think, are those characters who just uh, kind of sprang out of the ether. So let me read you the scene. Um, and this will be the final reading that I do. There was a number on the door, but no sign, no name. Leon stood paralyzed until he heard the muffled voice on the other side. Come open. It's not locked. He obeyed. Mr. George hadn't exaggerated. It was a closet, just large enough for a desk, chair, and a shelf crammed with toppling piles of books tape cassettes and records. The man sitting at the desk held a black book open in his knotted hands. Leon knew it was the Bible. Close, the man said, and Leon shut the door behind him. There was a single window, but it faced an air shaft. The sun had never graced this space. There was just enough light from the desk lamp to spark gleams in the old man's eyes. Two slits, curtained by curling gray brows. So, new, no, you ought to say, or I should guess. Foreign but familiar, he sounded like half the shopkeepers in Harlem. The man wore a black suit and a white shirt buttoned at the throat with no tie. A white disc, like a frisbee, rode the top of his dense, springy hair, the same gray as the eyebrows and beard. The eyes were so small, the lids so narrow, the brows so dense, Leon was convinced the old man was blind. He opened his mouth to speak, but nothing came out. Okay, I'll guess. Everyone in church thinks you sing like angel. 
Someone tells you my son will give you a break, but he won't see you. George, an elevator, took pity and says, you should talk to me. Yes? Leon nodded. More or less. Come closer. Leon took two steps forward. He could see that man's eyes now ignited coals of fire and ash. Do you believe in God? Yes, sir. Call me rabbi. Everyone does, even though I'm no rabbi. No matter. God doesn't care. If you believe, you must pray. Let me hear you pray. I pray by singing. Me too. So sing. Leon shut his eyes, slowed his breathing, opened his mouth, and let the spirit move through him, just like in church. Wade in the water. He started low. He didn't think. He didn't strain. He let the music out. Wade in the water. Children, wade in the water. The voice climbed. The air trembled with light. Wade in the water. God's going to trouble the water. He opened his eyes and everything went dark again. Neither spoke, but there was no need. A chord and a chord vibrated and faded between them for the love of God. Mr. Rabbi, another beat of silence, could you sing what you pray? The rabbi put the Bible down gently on the desk. He held his hands before his eyes. His lips trembled, and then a single, pure note, like the upper register of a clarinet, but sweeter and sadder, filled the room. Shema Yisrael. He took an air and the voice soared, Adonai Eloheinu, nasal, almost whining. The notes spiraled and spread as smooth as water. Leon, suspended over the precipice, held his breath, Adonai Echad. As soon as he finished, Leon sang the prayer back to him, blurring the strange words, but perfectly hitting the notes, the sobbing cry, the ancient liquid warbling. He stopped and smiled at the old man. I like that twangy wail. That sounds kind of cool. For Jews, our most important prayer, the old man said. Top of the charts. You heard before? Leon shook his head. First time and you pick up just like that? Leon nodded. The old man nodded back. Okay, take chair. There was a gray metal folding chair propped against the bookshelf. Sit, listen. So that's, as I said, came to me uh, just out of nowhere. I, you know, when I sat down to write that morning, I had no idea that that was going to come out. And that's one of the things I really love about writing fiction. Fun. Well, thank you for that. Uh, for those who, who are attending, if you have questions, there is a Q&A bottom at the bottom if you want to click into that, or you can put them in the chat. Um, I'm going to give people a second or two, and I have, a, a, I guess, a question I'd like to toss out to you, David, that um, about it. And I'll, I'll also just make the point in the, in the chat is a link for those of you who um, not necessarily want but need to buy this book right now because it, it's well worth it for all of you. So we've talked a bit about this um, together, the idea of this being sort of a, a YA, you had mm. thought of it sort of as a YA novel. And, mm. and I know you talked um, in your book launch with uh, Deb Coletti, who's, YA, who's a, young, a YA author and has given you a bunch of advice. And so the idea, I guess, and I just want a very quick part of this question because I have a follow-up. Mm -hmm. What is it that makes it YA? I mean, what mm -hmm. did, what do you think of as a YA novel? I mean, you, it's sent. This book is centered on a young man. Is that mm -hmm. it? Part of it. Uh, a couple of things. That's that's a really good question. Um, partly, it's the age of the characters. Um, you know, kids like to read about kids, and I heard that kids like to read up. So, if you're 15, you want to read about 17 year olds. If you're 17, you want to read about 22 year olds. Whatever. Um, but that's not everything. Um, so I think what I had in mind was I am a fan of YAs because I feel like they are very clear. They're very vivid. They're very immediate. They move quickly. Uh, the characters can be very honest, very naked in some ways. They're not as defended and snarky or what have you as, as older characters. I mean, they could, you know, in a YA, two kids can sit down 
uh, and say, you know, do you believe in God? Do you believe in a life after death? And that's what kids talk about or think about. Whereas in an adult book, it would seem a little crude. Um, and I, I like the fact that uh, they're snappy. A lot happens. Um, you know, of, of course, YAs are different. You know, everyone is different. But I think that in general, there's this kind of, um, you know, quick paced and easy to get. It kind of sucks you in quickly and holds your attention. Okay, uh, so let, let, me, let, me, yeah. let, me, let me interrupt. So Let's do it. You keep talking about Ivan Doig and some of mm -hmm. his best and most beloved books fit that. So was Ivan Doig a YA author? Oh, well, he was, and he wasn't. Ivan, I, re I still remember when the whistling season, you know, was a huge hit for Ivan. Um, and I remember seeing Ivan and Carol for dinner and Ivan kind of chuckling like, oh, you know, there's kind of crossover appeal for the whistling season to the YA world. And I think he might've gotten some award or something. Um, and I was like, what? Ivan's not a YA author. This is before I kind of embarked on my own discovery and, and admiration for YAs. I thought, oh, come on, that's, that's demeaning. But no. So I think Ivan, I've, and Ivan was delighted um, that, that his books uh, were read by kids or high school students say. So I would say Ivan wrote books for an adult audience that could and did appeal to kids. I weirdly wrote, set out to write a YA that ended up uh, being published as an adult book. But uh, you know, if, the, if anybody has kids or is a kid out there in the ether, try it. Uh, you know, I think um, you know, I definitely think that this book is uh, something that that kids would enjoy. And in fact, I did a podcast interview uh, a while ago, and the, uh, the the host, bless his heart, said. Oh, I could totally see this book being taught in high school English classes. So I thought, hey, hey, that sounds good. But yeah, so I definitely there is a YA element, but you know, I also think these categories are, you know, uh, somewhat arbitrary. Right. So um, a question was asked. So the book ends in basically the sum the summer that it begins, or later in the year it begins. So we leave Sammy at the age of eighteen or nineteen. So what would he be like today? Okay, so I actually kind of thought through some of Sammy's future. You know, it's funny, um, writing fiction, I, I don't know whether other people do this too, but I find I need the backstory, even if it's not gonna go in the book. And to some extent, I need the, the, the part, the future story. So here's how I thought of Sammy. Sammy was gonna graduate from college in like 1974. And he was going to be on his college newspaper. He was on his high school newspaper. And he was going to become an investigative reporter specializing in wars. I don't know why I thought that. So Sammy was going to have a lot of overseas time writing about war. And, um, and also, to some extent, racial justice. I think that was going to be another theme. Sammy would um, end up having some kids and actually... Uh, in one version of the book, in my mind, I was going to have an epilogue in which one of Sammy's kids discovers this manuscript in the closet. And that was the book. Uh, I love those, you know, I, I think the Scarlet Letter starts that way, you know, oh, this was found at the bottom of some, you know, dusty right. drawer in, you know, in the, in the, uh, the port keeper's house. So I was going to have this kind of frame where Sammy's kid goes, wow, dad was involved in all this crazy stuff. So didn't happen. It was probably fortunate, but definitely, I definitely had Sammy's uh, future scoped out. Interesting. So here's a question, and, and this could really sort of um, apply to really any writer, but you get to answer it. What would be the, your five most ideal keywords be for one doing a Google search that would lead them to your book? Wow. Five. Okay. Five. Um, uh, counterculture. Uh, Black Panthers. Uh, coming of age. Let's say that's one word. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, New York City. 
and uh, end of an era. Wow. I could probably refine that. That's the, that's the first draft. But first draft. Yeah, I like that question. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. That, I, um, so the novel's reckoning with race and privilege and homegrown terrorism resonates profoundly with hot issues of today. How front of mind was the present day as you wrote a novel set in the early 70s? Short answer, very. Um, I deliberately set out, well, I wouldn't say set out, but at some point it, I consciously kind of wrote and wove in insights and perceptions that only somebody living through the, I even hate to say the name, the former guy's administration and those four years, um, only somebody who endured that could think, could know, but I kind of mapped it back onto 1970. So I was very much writing from the point of view of our present onto um, that, that period 50 years ago. But I will say that, um, you know, I think of this past summer as at least the part of it as kind of the Black Lives Matter summer when Black Lives Matter went mainstream in the, in the aftermath of George Floyd's death. And I think the, the understanding of institutional racism and privilege and just that I think was something that hit home for everyone. Well, Sammy was done well before um, that summer. I mean, Sammy took a while to get born partly because of COVID and other publishing reasons. So I think the line from the Black Panthers to Black Lives Matter is straight and direct. And this is certainly not something that I, that's original with me, um, but I didn't, that hadn't happened yet when I wrote the book. So some of it I had anticipated and the storming of the Capitol hadn't happened either. And, you know, I guess it, you know, white supremacy and that their tilt to violence was brewing but I think the the eruption of uh, that that sickening display hadn't yet happened. So in some ways, I feel like I I, you know, I hate to brag, but I think I had my finger a little bit on the pulse of what's okay. going on. Well, here's a totally different direction for a question. So the person writes, "I've not read your book yet, but I've heard that it is quote full of gratuitous sex." Oh, golly. unquote. How would you respond to a comment like that? Oh, well, first of all, it's not gratuitous. Um, wow, but, you were getting redder and redder. <laughs> you know, this is really funny because, um, well, gee, I wonder where they heard this from. This is, this is really interesting. But no, I mean, hey, come on, this is 1969, 1970, free love. Um, you know, the sexual revolution, hello. So yeah, I also, teenagers. Um, I, I have to say I was, the sex, the sex is the sex. I mean, I, I don't think it's a dominant note. And so far, I've had a bunch of reviews, mostly very positive, And only one reviewer uh, kind of singled out the, the, the mention of the sex. And that was the, a student writing in the Harvard Crimson. And I thought, wait a minute, you're, you know, probably 18, year old, 18 years old yourself and you're shocked by sex. I thought you kids were, you know, doing Tinder and hooking up and whatever kids do these days, you know, it's unshockable. I, I would say if you've watched Bridgerton or pretty much any TV show these days, Sammy is very tame. There is nothing, uh, it, it's, it's there's, there's, there's nothing that will raise eyebrows for any adult or even a, even a high school student for that matter. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's an interesting response. But, but, um, let's, but let's, let's also be positive. I mean, maybe like, yeah, there's a lot of sex in the book, so people should pick it up because it's really titillating. Uh, so yeah, but anyway, not gratuitous. Well, anyway. I think on that note, <laughs> yeah, that might be a fun way to end it. Um, I'd like to, Thank uh, you, David, for your uh, 
honesty and for writing the book. I'd like to thank the uh, participants for asking questions. I think I have not been in a Q&A that um, before that has had uh, mentioned gratuitous sex. Yeah, and, that's a first for um, me too. And also uh, the, the question about Google. I mean, I think that's a really interesting way to think about yeah. books and how you define your book in the modern world. Right. So and I would like to turn it back over to our wonderful host, Tom Nisley, and leave it with him. Yeah, Tom, before you speak, can I just jump in for one more comment, uh, which is I'm probably one of the few people who has actually read David's new book, Home Waters, mm -hmm. and it is fantastic. I can attest. Um, I haven't read the final, final version, but um, yeah, you all... I mean, David, David has a large local following and they are going to be very happy with this new book. It's, it's, I think it's one of his best, so. Is, is the sex in it gratuitous? Or do you think it's- <laughs> Oh, you, the plot? Tom? Yeah, there's so much sex in that book. It's all with mollusks though, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, there, my book probably has as many sex scenes as David's and there's a lot more production going on than anything that happens in, in his. So um, I don't get, I'm not as tawdry because I'm younger no. and a little shyer about such things. Um, well, I am looking forward to David, <laughs> both David's books. Uh, I'm so grateful to spend this time with you guys and to have you, uh, to hear more about your book, David. Um, good luck with it the rest of the way. Um, hope to see you both in Finney Books at some point. Um, masks on for now. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for being part of Books in Common Northwest and thanks everybody for joining in.